Welcome back to the channel and uh, this is the final part now, part three for the Churchill build, uh, Tamiya Churchill that we're doing and this one's going to really tackle the figures as we can see here so we get a sprue of figures added with this more modern release of quite an old kit and we've got a French farmer figure, the farmer, uh, the farmer's cart which has got a couple of urns, some bottles lantern bucket etc and then we've got three crew figures so we've got a commander a loader and a gunner i believe or it might be the driver uh the one crouching at the front there and that's the sort of scene we're going to go for you also get two original figures from the 70s release um so there's quite a lot of figures in here and they're not too bad so starting off in the planning stage i just got uh, a cheap frame from a pound shop we take all of the stuff that we're not going to be using out uh, so that means the glass the piece of paper we get rid of all that but we're going to use the frame and the base this is not the professional way to go about bases this is really simple this is like you know you want to try a base on the cheap and this is a way you could do it for instance um naturally it seems that people who are doing more uh professional or advanced looking bases that are using the styrofoam and sort of digging into it and then that on the outside of that is framed with uh, flat card or wood or something like that to give you the finish so it's probably the way we'd go about it going forward but for this one this is it's just something simple just to knock up to help the build really uh just to round it off so we're putting together the cart there which is very simple as you would expect from tamia it does exactly what it's meant to do and the instructions all goes together nicely and with that together i'm just kind of getting the accessories uh put together now just to kind of get a feel for how it's all going to lay out and what it's going to look like and how it's going to work which is always important that the planning stage of any sort of diorama base any scene anything like that is very important but i must stress this is very very basic uh, you know, this isn't going to win any awards, but it does show you something. You know, if we're thinking on the first couple of builds, it's a nice way to finish off one of your early models. Is to have it on a on a base. It brings it to life, gives it scale. The figures give the tank scale. You, it's very easy for the human eye to see a human figure and then be able to scale with that. So it gives you that effect very well. So first off with figures, seam lines. That's something you get even with the most modern figures you still get that but this is a bit heavy i must admit the newer tamiya figures aren't quite as as bad as this so just going over with a knife i'm just scraping back those seam lines and this is something that all figure painters do whether you're talking about warhammer or you know even busts and all that sort of thing you do need to clean up lines that shouldn't be there mold lines seam lines whatever you want to call them and uh, once you're happy with that it was all over the figure as well down the down the sides there uh, you can kind of see the faint line where it was where it's all been smoothed off so i've actually assembled the figure i've put both arms on you can leave the arms separate you can leave the head separate or you can glue it all together and paint it as is um, there's pros and cons to both sides i have elected to glue it all together but usually i do keep the head separate but what drove me to thinking that i was going to actually glue on the heads is the way they join and i i couldn't see me getting a clean join using plastic glue i, mean, I could have used other glue um, and the joints weren't perfect so i wanted to actually get the heads the arms on and, and all sorted and then just worry about it being a little bit awkward in the painting stage and deal with it that instead of dealing with once it's painted getting glue marks or having gaps so that was the reason behind that so now we're putting together one of the figures as well for the tank which is the loader figure i think the one that's just sitting inside the loader's hatch and he's actually wearing a different uniform you got you got the two uh brit lads have got the overall the tank you know sort of jumpsuit overall whatever you want to call it the the dark green overall and then you've got this guy who's got uh more sort of khaki affair he's got the undershirt and khaki trousers on um, and quite an open neck there, so there's a, there's a lot of flesh tones. And as you can see, that's uh, it, that because of that gap. That's why I've decided to glue those on. And the arms meant to be resting on the leg as well, so it's another reason to get it glued together, just so we can get all of that in position 
and so that we're happy with it. And actually test fit the figures to the vehicle as well, because where you've got arms leaning on stuff, you want to um, you want to make sure it's all sitting where it needs to be. Uh, it makes it look a lot more realistic. So we've got the frame here from the uh, the picture frame, um, and it's got this kind of gold colour. So I'm just going to get rid of that. Again, this you wouldn't really do this if you were going to do it anything more than to a basic level. <clears throat> I'll just spray this with a Vallejo surface primer. The only reason I'm using that is I can't. I don't want to use it on anything else, and I've got tons of it. So where I can use it up, I do. It's not very good for models because for numerous reasons that we won't get into but it's fine for this uh, it does chip off a little bit and really you know sh you should sand the gold back if you want to do a proper job of it try and get some roughness to the paint uh, to, to wear at the surface as well so that the paint can adhere because it flakes off quite easily on the shiny surface now another important thing is so that we don't get any of the basing materials onto the frame I've actually drawn around the inside of the frame just using that as a guide which I'm going to then mask off with some tape so as we do all of the groundwork we can just peel the tape away and uh, and everything will be all right now what I'm using here is actually the wrong stuff but I bought a blooming um, block of it so I, I got to get through it this is insulation board which is not the right stuff. You'd want a similar thing, but you can see where it's gone to bits everywhere. There's flaky bits come off of this all over the place. And sorry for the poor footage here, but this was this was all I could do at the time. Um, so this foam is... You can buy this in hardware shops in the UK. Uh, other countries actually have the correct stuff in hardware shops, but I, it's a struggle to find it in the UK. The little bit of research I did, I think you can find it in the colder places. So... Uh, I think up in Scotland, B&Q, for instance, would actually have the hard styrofoam in those scenarios. Uh, but they don't have it down here in the, in the balmy southwest. Um, and it seems to be in colder countries as well, is where they stock this. Um, so this here is, is like what you put in to loft insulation and that sort of thing, which is the right stuff. It is like a polystyrene, but it's flaky. It, so it, it just, the minute you touch it, it goes to dust. What you want is the stuff you can get off of Amazon now, which is either the blue foam or black foam, and it's it's compressed and it's solid. So as you you, you almost saw through it, and um, you don't get a lot of uh, bits coming off. Uh, but this does the job as long as you cover it with something like this, which is Daz Clay. So this is your, um, you can buy it anywhere, Hobbycraft, whatever, online. Um, pound shops even have it. Um, and this is air drying clay. So what we're doing with this is manipulating it with water to smooth it down. And then we're just doing this to easily and quite cheaply fill up the groundwork. There's a million different things you can use here and they all have different properties and some are good and some are bad. This is bad in particular for uh, actually pulling in the sides quite, quite a lot. So where it's a thin piece of wood, because this is so much uh, water to kind of dry off, it, it it compresses and it contracts which then pulls the sides in you get a curved bottom and you it's it's difficult to actually put enough weight on it to stop that and even if you do it does still tend to do it but if you had something like a more solid piece of wood it wouldn't be able to pull it in it would just shrink on top of the wood or if you've got the styrofoam like i was mentioning before as well that can't bend either so it, it won't bend that but for this process this is fine this is absolutely the perfect stuff to use uh, but you could also use fillers uh, there's even you could go down the AK route if you you know money's no object you can just buy all of the right stuff or from the wargaming basing material so don't use this is just a guide look at this as a guide of how you might be able to do it one way there's 20 other ways at least that you could do it so feel free to explore that um, I we, we do another basing uh, video shortly and that's done differently using the same stuff but on a thicker piece of wood and we don't get any of the same issues and to this day this has still got a curved base <laughs> but you know don't worry about it it's it, these aren't to be perfect these aren't forever projects you want to look at these as a way in uh to learn so now that's dried i'm just cutting down that edge a little bit where it didn't actually mask quite well i didn't mask it as you can see i haven't put masking tape on this Usually I would, and then now I'd peel away the masking tape. 
Uh, but what I've done instead is to actually just cut that away now. So using a very sharp sort of box cutter, as you, you'd call it. Uh, that's how we get away. Now, again, apologies. Uh, because this was done in the summer, I actually lost a tiny bit of footage here. So we skip uh, past this point to me actually painting it, which was, I've got it here to hand. It was um, some cheap watercolour paint from the works. I just painted the whole thing with burnt umber, which is like a water-based... It says watercolour paint. I mean, that gives you the wrong idea. It's more of like a poster paint, sort of. Think of it like that. Like a, just a, a watered down acrylic paint. So I paint all of this orange with that a couple times to, uh, to, to let that look like a more earthed colour. And then using just a bit of sand from work, I've got a plant nursery, so we've got lots of sand. Um, I've got just fine sand, and that's what I've sprinkled over that road section. Now, you may ask, uh, why, <laughs> if this is a beginner's build, why am I using a £50 static uh, uh, grass applicator? Good point. The, question, the, the, the answer to that is I just bought it and I was too excited that I couldn't not use it. Um, do not buy a static grass applicator for your first diorama base, etc., unless you want to. Because it's a lot of money and it's not really essential until you're going to get into it seriously. What the static grass applicator does is using static uh, elec electricity, because it's got a little sort of battery in there, it, uh, it just makes the static grass stick up instead of lay flat. So it sticks up on its end under the static um, electricity effect, and then that glues into the PVA glue, and it stays there. You can do the same thing almost as well, but not quite, by sprinkling it on, uh, so what we do here is we paint the PVA glue all over the section we want it and instead of doing what I'm doing by knocking it out of the static grass just sprinkle it out of a jar of your fingers out of the bag whatever and then as it's starting to dry off just with a tiny tiny bit of air pressure in your airbrush if you just sort of just tap the airflow in and around it you'll find it will move it around and it will start to lift up a bit more as well so that's another effect which I should have done here but I got overexcited by having a new toy that I wanted to use. But I've explained the way to do it, so you can obviously go around it uh, like that. And for those who want to know, this is the uh, War World Scenics Pro Grass Microstatic Grass Applicator, which is £50 on eBay. Uh, and it's about as good as they get for that price, from what I can see. It's It's got the um, handmade look to it, I must admit. It looks like some, some chap's knocking these out in a workshop, but it works very well very good and it's something we'll come back to later on in the series so back to the figures what I have done with each of the figures is airbrush them the color that they have the most of on their clothing so this farmer has uh, dark yellow trousers so that's what I've sprayed it so I don't need to paint those by brush and then we've got a dark brown kind of waistcoat leather feel to it if you if you if you like and then he's got a light undershirt so all of that is um well, the, the brown's quite a dark color but it's light colors going over a light yellow base even though this paint is called dark yellow it's, it's not a dark color so that's worked very well now for this i'm just using tamio acrylics out of the bottle um that is probably the worst paint you could use to paint figures. However, it is possible, you can do it. And I'm, again, thinking from the beginner's point of view, you're not going to have tons of different paint brands. You're not gonna go out and buy Citadel paints or ammo paints or oil paints just to paint figures if you're just building a handful of tanks. You, you, you know, you're gonna be using the colors, more or less, that you've used to paint your tanks with. And you might think, I'm just gonna paint one of these figures that come with the Tamiya kit. So this is why I'm using this here. And uh, my best advice to you is to water down the paints, use a palette, uh, so whether that's a wet palette, I've got, a, you know, there's a link below to my video on what a wet palette is. Um, they're easy to make at home. You can use something like that and that makes it usable a lot more. And um, workability, which is a word, I looked it up, some chap said it might not be a word in one of my previous videos, but it is, and I will continue to use it. It, it, <laughs> it prolongs the workability of the paint, 
And uh, that there is one of the main issues with Tamiya. So if you're going to just get the Tamiya pot and you're going to get it straight from the pot and you're just going to dip your brush straight in the pot and brush it on, you're going to have a, a number of problems. It's going to dry too fast, it's going to go on thick, it's not going to dry thin and show the details, it's going to obscure details. It's much better, as all the figure painters say, uh, in the wargaming side and all of that, is uh, thin your paints, you know, two thin coats, as a, a certain chap says on the Warhammer universe and it's quite right um it's better to do two three thin coats as opposed to one thick coat and um as we go forward i've been exploring a few things with some figure painting this is with tamio acrylics i've used citadel um acrylics as well which we've got some of but i've also i think personally that the way you're going to get somewhere with figure paintings with oil paints certainly for the blending and, and some of the finishing uh, touches but that is an advanced technique, so we will, you know, we will cover that much later on. But for this scenario, um, it's perfectly fine to go ahead and use the Tamiya acrylic paints. Uh, you don't necessarily need a small brush either. It's, I'm using quite a fine brush here, but it's not always the case. Of another particular problem people make when they're um, figure painting is by using. Um, a very fine brush, a very small brush, lots of paint strokes, lots of going back and forth, back and forth, and um, that actually brings into the the finish. It, it brings in a rough finish because there's so many different patches. Where it's, it'd be much better to go in with a thick brush with your thin paint, so a, a large brush, but with the thin paint, and go on and do it in one good covering. So you know you've only gone back to the palette once or twice. You've loaded up the brush, but it's not overly heavy and you can then just go in and put a smooth coat on so that might be something to explore it, it's probably worth if you've got any old figures some of these old figures from the 70s tamiya sets like the panzer II that we did at the start you know, they're almost useless they'd be a very good way to try some of these techniques and that would be my best advice is to actually just trial it um so I'm going to leave you now with a little bit of music because all I'm really doing is blocking in the colours and you'll, you'll see how that then develops. We do some highlights, but it's just using thinned down Tamiya paints, acrylic paints, and just using shades of them. And that's all I do. And it's only a, a few passes. So um, we'll jump back in. I'll leave you with the farmer figure. We'll go right through that without me talking. And then I'll come back in when we get to the tank crew.
So as you've seen that we've we've done sort of highlights and trying to deepen that colour. So just here on this um, khaki shirt, what we've done is actually made a few different shades um, using oil paints uh, to go over and fill out some of the uh, creases. So the the good thing with oils is that you've got a little bit more time. That that word again, workability. And we're just going in just to try and pick out the recesses here. So this is shadowing that I'm doing. So I'm just running in there, as you can see, with very thinned down oil paint. The good thing with the oil paint is that workability and the, the ability to be able to manipulate colours very easily. You only need a handful of colours and you can almost make all of them. <laughs> almost. Uh, so what, I, what I've actually done there is just try to deepen that play on the the sort of khaki color that the shirt is um and that then gives you depth that make that tricks your eye into thinking it's um it's deeper we've got the recesses but also just on the flat parts i'm kind of putting brush strokes in here and there where i want to kind of make you feel like there is a is a crease or um something's sort of pushing through at, at the at the shoulder blade or something like that and now on the legs we're actually do it just picking out that pocket so now we're doing it with a more darker brown color um, that large pocket that's on the thigh there we're just going to pick out the sides of that almost with like a pin wash just to deepen that and then as we get up onto the top of it we've got some recesses there again which i'm just kind of using as a guide but making them the, the size i want to We've got lots of creases down the side of the leg here. So again, we're just going in and we're only trying to paint inside those recesses. We're trying to leave the, the raised parts of the crease to give you a, a natural highlight. And then we can go over them again with lighter colour to give them a, an actual highlight using the paint. It's a simple process and it is something that looks tricky, feels tricky, especially if you've seen it on the finished model, it can look daunting and tricky but actually seeing it being done it's just like anything else we're doing all the way through this it's just like weathering a tank you know you've got your pin wash then you're you're trying to do all these different things and if you if you look at them as a list it can be quite daunting there's 20 things to do but if you actually go about doing them in a couple hours it's it's done and it, it, you know you've got a very realistic finish to it um uh, so again, slightly out of focus there. I'm learning that um, being a mini painter is not is uh, is as simple as it looks, but we uh, we sort that out soon. And once you've got those sort of shadows in, it's then a case of just going in and blending them out. Um, and you don't really want to blend them out onto the highlights but you do want to just kind of get rid of them from the shadow quite like what they are um, and then you just blend it in and it then sort of merges into being a filter at the same time i'm using a lot of words here which um none of these are what i you know, none of this is meant to be a filter but that is what it's going to do it's going to go out it's because it's not going to be taken off the actual uh, leg there it's going to go out and filter that color down and it what it will then do is blend back into where the shadow is that's the idea. Anyway, I'm using it. <laughs> Sounds good. But um, hopefully it makes sense and it's not too complicated. And I think it's it's reasonably simple if you take what I'm saying. And I'm, that's why I wanted to leave you with the visuals. That rather than me bumble through explaining it and not perhaps making it more complicated than it is, if you actually see it and then just think about the process in what's happening and what you're trying to do, it then unlocks it a little bit and makes it a bit easier. And you don't really need to be precise with any of this as well. I know it's um, difficult, you know, it's a lot of shaky hands or very hard to get in there uh, with detail painting. And, and basically, using those Tamiya acrylics, you just, you just paint one colour over the other until you get a sharp line. If you're doing the arm round to that collar, for instance, uh, <laughs> collar, the, um, uh, the, the cuff of the, the shirt there, you just do one colour and then cut it in with the next colour until it's close to where you want it to be, to have a sharp line. And you just keep doing it. And you you know, you will get there eventually. It will be okay. 
And none of what I've done here is anything spectacular. Uh, you can go a, um, a million miles away from where I am here to actually get good at figure painting. But this is almost like blocking in colours and looking okay from a distance. And again, that's all in keeping with the idea of this series. So I'm just blending those oils out again now with the thinners. This is, by the way, a lot of people have been asking, and I am going to cover the... Um, specifics on all of these things uh, in a later video this, there is no gloss coat here there's no matte coat this is tammy acrylics the oils are going straight on there with thinners not turpentine not anything like white spirit we're just using artist grade odorless thinners and that is what i would suggest you use because white spirits or the cheap things you get down the hardware shop are cheap they're rough they're coarse and they do cause problems and they're not meant for modeling and they're not really meant for oil paints it's just my my view it's better to use the artist grade and then you can be nice and safe so that's the figures about painted um and again i'm, I'm going to leave the visuals to do more of the talking than me and i think you want to sort of work it out yourself and, and get there on your own um, in your own way and just keep painting the figures that's my only advice paint more figures and you will get better we've got the glass bottles now so we want to make them look like red wine ish so using Tamiya Clear X27 Clear Red I've just dipped one of the clear bottles into that red and now I'm leaving it just to drain a little bit rather poorly I've dropped it about four times but that doesn't matter that'll be okay so we'll go again now just to try and do it um, without them flicking out of the tweezers. So give it a good dip. Oh, not all the way. That's important. This is meant to look like the red wine content. So you want this to go up to the kind of shoulder of the bot bottle for this effect. Obviously, red wine is a lot higher up usually. But there you see, that's, that's the kind of height. Someone's had a little drink out of a few of them. But, that, you know, we won't hold that against anyone. Now we're going to use the... Um, Tamiya Clear Green, and I missed the number. Was that X26? It's in the Tamiya cl uh, Gloss Clear Green, anyway. That's what it is. So now that red is dried, we're going to go in and dip the whole bottle, including the tips of the tweezers, which can cause a few problems, in the green. And then we're going to let that drain off down the side of the uh, bottle. Don't let it fall over. That's right. You want it. There, there you go. Just settle. And then that gives this effect, which when we look closely, gives us a green bottle with some liquid in it. I thought that was rather effective. Very simple technique and just adds a little bit to the uh, to the picture. This chap's trying to flog some, uh, some red wine to some brick tankers and they seem very happy about the whole thing. So that, that's the idea. Now, again, simple techniques. You can do this a million different ways. I've chosen to use some of these Humbral Weathering Powders, which is the Dark Earth. Um, and I'm just brushing that into the roughness of that sand, stony mix that I've glued onto the road. Uh, whether this looks like any road in, in Normandy or northern France, I, I wouldn't like to say. But for this, um, for this example, we don't need to worry too much. Now, do be careful with this stuff because it really is. Some pigments are OK. Some are, uh, are, are awful. They just go everywhere. And this is one of them. The, the humbral range of pigments are very very good at getting worked into anything they touch so you know, be warned and be careful but it's it's a cheap powder and it's a good way to use it up basically is what i'm trying to do here because I, I, it's not something i tend to use much more these days and there you can see it's just working that in And now we're placing the tank onto the scene. We've got one of the figures in the top there, just to try and get a feel of how we're going to place stuff. And again, this is the planning phase again. So we've got the cart there. We're just trying to work out whether that, how the whole thing's going to fit and where the old farmer's going to be. He's reaching up to the driver figure who's bending down. So we want to get them in line of sight and we want to get the bottle heading towards the, the driver's hands. We don't want it obviously them being out of sync because that would look weird that's that's the whole point you, you want to tell a story without having to you know you want to tell it visually it needs to be straightforward as you can see those two hands there don't want to be quite touching that would be a little bit different but they want to be heading towards each other 
Uh, I don't need to show you this. The, fact that the figure doesn't stand up. But I've left it in there for some reason. Anyway, um, with a bit of blue tack is probably what I want to be using here, just to kind of place it. Um, and then these will just be super glued in place. Uh, I've got I got something about trying to get this bloke to stand up for some reason. I mean, you can see the point. <laughs> and um, that's what that's the kind of look we're after there. And I think we need to finish this off by sticking the loader in. It's like playing with your toy soldiers, this, isn't it? It really is. But there we go. That's what we're looking for. And it's not bad. It's a nice little scene Tammy have given us out of the box there. Eh? So one last thing. We need to finish this tank off and weather it into the base. So the first thing is using this absolutely exceptional silver colour. It's a lacquer paint, so that brings with it its, its own problems. Uh, but this is Mr. Colour 8. Uh, and there's also a Mr. Hang on, Mr. No, no, Aqueous. The Aqueous range has got number eight in it as well, which is a silver as well. But it's not as good as this. Um, but it's okay. Now, looking at Churchill's, they do have quite polished tracks. Uh, there's quite a lot of, uh, of of metal there to, to meet the, the hard ground, so they do get polished up quite well. And this is a very high shine silver. Um, so again, bear that in mind. It's a little bit too shiny in certain circumstances. But it's okay here and we're using it. But any silver paint is the kind of dry brush method over the flat uh, parts of the track that do meet the ground. And that's where it polishes. Obviously, anything that doesn't meet the ground in a, in a solid way uh, isn't going to be polished. It's going to be more that kind of rusty or um, base coated metal colour. I usually go for black, but I have noticed... Churchill tracks do seem to be this brown colour. I don't know whether that's what the, the Brits used. Um, most countries seem to use a black primer colour uh, out of the factory, which was actually quite good at staying on the track, regardless of how much um, how far they went. Maybe some of these panzers that drove however many miles into Russia, pro it probably wore off of those. But um, a lot of these kind of Brit and US tanks that you know came off the boats and then were moved up through Normandy... Um, they did seem to be quite polished. Now, introducing something again here, we've got these weathering pigments. Now, you see these everywhere, and I've got one of the old ones, which is MIG's like, original MIG, which has now, I think, been re-released by AK, which is very confusing, but it's MIG Productions is the first one, European Dust. But I think he's since actually come out with the in the ammo range with a European dust, and I'm sure it's just as good. So with a healthy dose of that, I'm going all over the running gear, over the tracks, but upside down, so that all of these pigments work up. As you'll when you look at the tank, they'll be working up the side of the hull. And if we were doing this with the tracks on the ground, you'd be rubbing the pigments down the side, which is not how they would have gone onto the side of the tank. So just something to think about. With anything with weathering, you want to think, how would it have got there and try and replicate that? And you'll find that, it, like with aircraft, for instance, you, you follow the airflow. That's kind of what we're doing here. We're following the flow of where the mud would kick up the side by going at it from the underneath. Uh, and now I'm actually working in some of that um, Humbral uh, powder as well. And you can see it's got, mu the coverage is, is just goes a long way. And it's very um, strong. So you want to be careful with that one if you're using some of the humbral powders. Less is more with those, but the MIG powders, they're fine. You can actually go, um, you can you can add quite a bit with them. So I'm just trying to add dust effects. And another one of the questions that people always ask, to answer the question, this is pigments placed over a matte coat and there will be no fixing of these pigments. Uh, I never fix pigments. I've never even tried it uh, or even thought about it. Um, I'm a bit loath to do it. I don't feel like you need to do it unless you're going to be handling the model a lot. The one problem you do get in this scenario is you get fingerprints into the pigments. I have not noticed in moving the tanks in and around my display cabinet or anything like that that huge amounts fall off. If you were to put them on a white paper, piece of paper, you would find that you'd have uh, the pigment marks would be left. So there is that. There, you know, It does deposit stuff. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, to give that natural look, 
Uh, I actually prefer leaving them like they are. But you can obviously use your pigment fixes. So that everyone does them. So I just obviously be brand specific if you're going to do it. And then use them as, um, as is directed. And that's uh, probably the best way to go about it. Well, uh, the brush I'm using here is actually quite a large... It's almost like bordering on a makeup brush. I don't think it is. I think it's a very cheap art brush. Um, that would have come from a set, but it's very, very fluffy and it's good for this sort of thing. It's no good for paint or anything, but it's brilliant for working in uh, these pigments. If you use a coarse brush, you'll find that you'll get lines in, you'll see the lines of the brush, but if you use a very soft, fluffy brush like this, you'll get rid of that, you'll just blend all the edges. Much like makeup, I suppose, but that's probably why they use it, I guess, um, to blend the edges. It's probably called a blending brush. There we go, in full circle, look. So we're just going all the way around where any mud and, and dust is going to be kicked up. I say mud, we're not trying to do mud here. That's, that's the wrong term. We're trying to do dust. Uh, from dusty roads, travelling all the way across Northern Europe in summer. That's, that's what's happening here. Uh, we're looking, we've got the rain marks from the oils. And then you can actually cut back through these pigments. And that's a very good technique is to then go back to where we were with the weathering with the oils. And where these pigments are on the side, just let a tiny little bead cut through there uh, to give you kind of rain marks that will have gone through. Or, or if there's a fuel cap or anything like that, put some um, dark oil in and around there and you'll find it will give you a really nice effect and be very natural looking. So that there does complete this um, this build. It's actually turned into a bigger one than I expected. I was going to do this Churchill as, as a one video in itself, but uh, the figures were there and I thought this would round off the beginning of this series. I'm just going to finish off by gluing on the stowage very simply with a bit of super glue. Now, this brings us to a kind of landmark position in this uh, in this series. We have now completed my vision for the absolute beginners the i'm going to hobby craft in the uk anywhere it was hobby lobby in the us i suppose because i'm in a lockdown i'm going to buy the tank i'm going to buy the paints i'm going to buy the glue all from there and i'm going to go home and build a model and i'm going to stick on youtube and find someone who can help me to do it that was the intention for this series that is why i've started the last three builds like that so we've done some very okay kits very basic stuff but what we're going to do going forward is now explore that and try and move ourselves through covering all of the techniques as far as a beginner can do and then try and move into more intermediate level and then move into some advanced techniques as well. I'm taking it very slow. I've got, uh, I've got a whole range of stuff already filmed. As you're watching this, there's plenty of videos already waiting just to be uh, launched on the weekly basis. So these are going to be weekly videos continuing. Uh, next up, we're going to jump straight in with a Sherman. And uh, not just any Sherman, we're going to be using the Zvezda, brand new M4A2, uh, which is the Russian one. Um, it was also the American one, but we're, we're doing it as a, as a Russian Lend-Lease vehicle. So that gives you an idea of some of the things that we're going to start doing. We're going to move away from Tamiya for periods. We're going to actually look at... Um, doing more advanced things i'm also going to stop talking about hobby craft because that is not the best place to go and buy tanks it's not the best place to really buy anything hobby related because it's all full retail price it's fine if you're dropping in but if you're buying online it's probably the last place you'd go because there's so many different places you can go that's actually cheaper so we can look at that um we're going to have some uh bonus episodes as well which probably won't land on as part of the weekly episode they'll be standalone so they're drop in as we go forward uh, we've got a few more looking at basing techniques and um, shortly we're going to be returning back to the africa core as well like we started off in the first video with the panzer II, and then we're just going to carry on through i'm trying to balance it we're mainly staying in world war ii but i am going to add in some first world war vehicles into war vehicles and I am going to do a modern tank, but that's a long way off. I'm not uh, not slightly ready for what we're going to do there, but that is the plan as we go through. There's plenty coming, and um, 
I really would advise if you're if you've enjoyed any of these videos to like subscribe etc follow this playlist and uh, stick with me because there's going to be a lot coming down the line and I think it's going to be a nice interesting series uh, for for many of you to follow along so uh, thanks for everyone who has commented uh, I don't reply to all the comments but I certainly do read them all and thanks to everyone who's liked subscribed etc as we've gone through it's uh, much appreciated and it looks as though I've actually helped a few of you so that's um, that's brilliant that's exactly what the series is designed for uh, if you want to help the channel there's a couple links down below where you can look to do that with a patreon page and and uh, and paypal uh, and obviously you can also help the channel as always by liking the video commenting on the video uh, let me know your feedback because everything um uh, because everything that uh, these videos receive is is greatly greatly received by me and i really do enjoy reading all of your comments i hope we can sort of continue this uh, together so as i said next video is the m4a2 sherman from zvezda which is one of the brand new releases and a cracking kit spoiler alert that you can get for around the 20 pound mark and that will be released next week so as always thanks for watching and i'll see you in the next video